I'm inviting you to a little imagination activity. Imagine that you can take all of your experiences that you have made at this Congress, take them home with you and share them with your friends and your family. Everything. The first time that you tried mate, the moments, endless moments of going through the labyrinth of this Congress hall and getting lost for the hundredth time, trying to enter the club downstairs and feeling like you can cut the smoke with a knife, or actually being very surprised and seeing Snowden appear on stage. So all of these wonderful memories, imagine you can record them and you can take them home with you. Today, this kind of recording activity or possibility is actually possible to make. There's technology that could theoretically record everything 24-7. Kai Kunze will give us an overview of central and actual actuation technology, and he will tell us what the future holds for AR and VR. He has brought with him some experiences, some projects that are actually happening right now, and will give us an overview of how we are already pushing the boundaries today of human sharing experience. Kai is a researcher in variable computing, in AR and VR, and really cool, he's also a founding member of the Japanese Superhuman Sports Society. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, is, is this on? And with further ado, Kai Kunze. Enjoy. Is the mic on? Yeah, okay. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the great introduction. And yeah, thanks a lot also for waking up so early in the morning to come and join the talk. It's always a special occasion for me to talk at the uh, Chaos Communication Congress. And I hope then for the next you know, 30 minutes or so on, I won't be wasting your time. So the talk will be about, you know, kind of from superhuman sports to amplifying human senses. And um, as the introduction said already, you know, kind of, we are in the year zero of consumer available VR devices. So uh, Oculus, uh, the wife, and also the Sony VR system and the cheaper uh, cardboard variants like Google Cardboard and so on. And we are on the brink of getting consumer level AR. And, you know, kind of already my grandparents have HoloLens. So, um, yeah, in this case, I always like to include uh, pictures of my grandparents because they are awesome. They always try out any type of technology I give them and they provide valuable feedback. However, I have to start with a big disclaimer, and I will disappoint you, especially regarding the, the great introduction I got for the talk. Please don't trust me, especially about predictions. Uh, I was working 15 years now in the variable computing field, and around 2004, I thought, you know, today we would run around like this. And I see a lot of you you're kind of wearing your head-mounted displays and having your one-handed keyboard. Nobody. Oh. Damn it. So I'm really, really bad with predictions. And you know, kind of that was me at the time. One handed keyboard, Cubic. This is a belt integrated computer from, from ETH. Uh, at the time, you have to remember, we didn't have smartphones, so we had to carry our computing somewhere else. And then, you know, kind of seriously, a couple of years back, I also thought this would be a thing. So, so Google Glass and this type of stuff. So don't trust me about predictions and uh, don't trust me on what's coming next. However, for this talk, you might wonder, why did you get up so early in the morning then? What I will do today is I will talk a little bit about a hot topic in Japan right now, and that's uh, superhuman sports. Uh, the idea for superhuman sports is to use technology to enhance human uh, abilities uh, over, you know, kind of what we usually can do. And because, you know, we are in Japan, we, of course, founded a society, so since one and a half years, we have the Superhuman Sports Society. Disclaimer, as said in the introduction, uh, I'm one of the society members, uh, and also one of the... So, originally, the idea came from Inami-sensei and Rikimoto-sensei, 
uh, and Nakamura. I usually don't like name dropping, but especially if you're interested in human augmentation and human computer interaction, check out all the works from Inami and Rekimoto and also follow them closely because they are two of my personal heroes. And then, you know, kind of we have the society now, we're trying to expand it internationally. So since a couple of months, we're working with uh, TU Delft, the Sports Engineering Institute. And I don't want to bore you longer. However, I just want to highlight one person in the advisory board, and that's uh, Robert Riener, because Robert kind of saved 2016 for me. Because, you know, it started all with Bowie and uh, so on, and then Brexit and Trump. But Robert organized uh, the Cybertron in uh, Zurich. I just wondered how many of you heard about the Cybertron? Oh, okay, a couple. Whoa, nice. Uh, has anybody been there? Oh, yeah, even great. Uh, cool, my kind of audience. Uh, awesome. So in this case, um, this was an international competition for disabled uh, competitors uh, using bionic assistive technology, so exoskeletons and so on. And, you know, kind of that was just uh, great. And it's in the, uh, in the terms of what I want to talk to you about today. But what I want to talk to, to you about today is then superhuman sports and I kind of um, selected these type of topics, so augmenting our body, augmenting the playing field, augmenting training and cheering, and I will show you a couple of examples from researchers in the society. So first, going over to augmenting our body, there's a lot of work also mechanically that's not so interesting for us computer scientists, however it looks cool, so I included it. Uh, one is a company called Skeletonics, they manufacture these um, exoskeletons, they are completely moved by muscle movement, so nothing IT here, but still cool. Uh, and then uh, another thing is the bubble jumper, that's an idea that came out of a hackathon we organized uh, at KO, and we started, you know, kind of with uh, uh, first sketches and so on, but the important part for also for our hackathons is you have to demo, you have to implement. It should be playing, oh yeah. <laughs> so you see the combination of uh, a bubble ball and sky runner, and to make a very safe and <laughs> nice sport. <laughs> yeah, coexistence of safety and force. I'm not so sure about the safety. And now, getting over this to something a little bit more serious, uh, spider vision. Uh, this is now work from Inami Sensei, and in this case, this is really about extending uh, the human field of view. And it's very, very simple. They use the DK1, and they have two cameras, one in front, one in the back, and then they overlay the two uh, video feeds on top of each other, like you will see right here. And the interesting part is, at the beginning it looks really terrible, but after two or three minutes using this, you can really separate the two images and you can even read or do other things. So, you know, kind of then you can be environmentally aware. <laughs> the only trouble is, and that's something you see here, because you're wearing a, a, a head-mounted display still, a, a VR set, uh, you know, there's an offset from the camera to your actual eyes, so it's very hard to interact with your environment. But that's kind of initial work where we want to get at. Uh, the next work I want to show you is the synesthesia suit. That's a full body haptic feedback suit made by Mizuguchi and uh, Minamisawa Sensei, two of my colleagues at Keo Media Design. And this was first done to promote REST. That's a, a VR game for uh, the PlayStation. And what it gives you, you see it here on the right side, is it has a haptic feedback uh, vibrators, uh, 24 on the whole body. So you can get a touch feeling on your whole body. 
And the idea Mizuguchi Sensei wants to do with this is he wants to give you simultaneously visual as well as auditory and haptic and touch feedback to put you in some kind of trance state. And if you try, you know, rest with this suit, it's quite an experience actually. So you get, you know, visual, auditory and touch uh, feedback at the same time. Then moving over to augmenting the sports field. Uh, here I want to highlight a work from uh, Rekimoto Sensei, Aqua Cave. You see a water tank you can swim in, but the swimmer actually wears 3D shutter glasses and you have a 3D display around the water tank so you can then really dive in uh, the great uh, near the Great Barrier Reef, or you can do uh, competitions with sharks and similar things. Um, then augmented training. Uh, here I will show a little bit of old work. Maybe some of you will know, but I just find it cool enough to still include it, and that's galvanic vestibular stimulation by Maeda and also Inami Sensei. And what they were doing in 2004 is they apply a tiny current behind your ear. So you have anode and cathode behind your ear. And what happens if you apply this tiny current is you're messing with your equilibrium, with your sense of equilibrium. So you will tend towards the anode if you do that. And then now the reason why I show this video is because, you know, this would be impossible to do for a researcher in Europe or US. You see a student wearing this device, you see the professor with a control unit and... <laughs> can steer the person just left and right. And I have to say, uh, I tried it. Uh, it's you know, kind of, it's not safe to try out. We don't know about long-term effects. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting, and it's also user dependent. So kind of depending on the user and depending on your skin, you might need more or less of this uh, the, the, uh, electricity. Uh, but it's an interesting thing to think about, especially for sports that require equilibrium or other things. And then uh, another work, uh, this is work from one of my students, Takoro. He was working on peripheral vision glasses. And his first idea was to just, you know, give you notifications in a way that other people don't realize. So, you know, I could look still into your eyes and you don't realize that I might get some notification on my peripheral vision. I can still keep eye contact. Because so far, you know, if you look at your handy or if you look at your watch, the other person will realize that you're, you're looking there. So he started with this idea and you know, kind of the boring thing is, yes, it works for notifications. So you can have up to eight different types of notifications. I don't know why the video stopped, but that's actually not so important. Um, you can have eight different types of notifications. The other person cannot see that you, you're getting them. However, what he really wants to do, and here we get to the interesting part, is he wants to try to influence movement over your peripheral vision. And there's some uh, other research, some interesting research uh, from Furukawa et al., uh, also augmented human conference. They use some patterns on the floor to guide pedestrians, to influence the movements of uh, pedestrians. And then um, Takoro wondered if it's possible using uh, then also peripheral vision glasses. And this is the first test. This is partly unpublished, but I thought I want to share it with you. So in this case, what he's using is he's using some lines that move along this way and he lets people walk. And guess what happens if you let the lines move faster? Yeah, I heard. So people will move slower. So walk slower. Uh, so it's already possible to maybe... Uh, use it to influence speed, and the next thing he wants to try is also try to influence direction. Uh, so the next thing then is augmenting a watch and cheer. Um, so in this case, um, I want to show uh, effective wear. Um, that's glasses that uh, can detect your facial expressions and in a very cheap or simple way. 
uh, that's uh, Masai, and you see kind of the faces he makes. He wears his own uh, self-made glasses. And how this works is he uses just photoreflective sensors in the glasses frame, and he detects the distance to the skin. And with this, you can get user-dependent very well uh, what type of expressions a person is doing. So you see then the... I like the training phase. So you, here you see the photoreflective sensors and the distance measures between the sensors. And then, you know, kind of for the start, he has to uh, then uh, calibrate the sensors once. And here you see the principle. So, uh, for example, for smiling, you know, kind of your cheeks move up. Uh, so it's easy to recognize that you're smiling and even laughter. So eight facial expressions are recognizable. Uh, and yeah, and I like just... Masai making faces, that's the normalization phase, then the training phase, and then the recognition phase. That's user dependent, but it's very cheap. And if you want to build this, especially smiling is easy. You just need one photo reflector here above the cheekbone, and then uh, one maybe for reference, and then it's easy to implement. So, we, of course, you know, kind of what we can do with this is we can put it into uh, a VR headset and then your character in VR can have the same facial expressions. You can think about remote participants in, a, uh, in, a, um, in an event or so on and then also showing the mood or so on of the remote participants. It's not playing. Yeah, but I think you get the idea. I don't know why the video stopped. Um, and, you know, kind of also more interesting then is you can also, uh, you know, kind of maybe use this for design. So if you want to design a very, very scary dungeon, you can, you know, kind of detect how people are, oh, no, it's playing, yeah, uh, how people are reacting to some elements in your VR environment and then uh, do the correct adjustments. And also, you know, you could wear it throughout the day and just get an overview over your daily activities. So, you know, kind of how much smiling versus frowning are you doing? Uh, also related to some of the activities you have. Uh, that, that's interesting and that's in line with some work also from Rekimoto Sensei who did the happiness counter. So here the idea is he uses smile as an interaction modality. So, you know, in the morning when you wake up and your alarm clock rings, um, you don't have to push a button, but you have to smile to your alarm clock. That's a little bit scary or creepy. And because we are with this, this next one is a little bit of a joke. You know, kind of if you, if you recognize that you don't smile enough, um, we can also make you smile. <laughs> so this is now... Chunichi's smile is now activated over the electrodes. <laughs> As I said, this is a little bit of a joke. I don't recommend anybody, or I hope nobody will make these type of technologies in future. But here the interesting part is people, um, uh, students were playing with uh, EMS, and we recognized so, uh, one of the main, most of the nerves to uh, control our face actually come over from this side of the face. So what you can do is if you put electrodes on different parts here, you can actually activate different muscles. Uh, the students wanted to get smiling working, but first when they tried it on me, it was my eye was blinking and other things. Uh, you can also do eye blink. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, this is a little bit on the joke side, as I said before. However, if you want to have references for more serious uh, electric muscle stimulation work, I refer you to Max Pfeiffer and also uh, Pedro Lopez. Uh, they also have a, a kit out, so two uh, references to URLs if you want to build it your own or if you want to build your own EMS. And also their source code for all of their papers is, I think, out there on Bitbucket and GitHub. Um, yeah, and this is also just cool, you know, cruise control for pedestrians and also uh, a muscle plotter, so uh, using your body as output for a computer. Um, however, now getting back to the um, superhuman sports, so the idea also for the superhuman sports society is to, walk, to work towards uh, Olympic 2020. And we want to create actually an augmented game culture in Japan. So not only inventing new sports and using new sports to 
uh, pursue amplifying human senses, but also creating this culture to make these sports. So we are organizing workshops. This is an example from from YCAM, uh, beginning of this year. Uh, so you know, kind of, you have a lot of uh, devices. You get together researchers, artists, designers, but also uh, uh, local people that are just interested in participating. We do you know one day of ideation and trying out the different uh, types of technologies and uh, and research outputs. So this is, for example, also check-in. Uh, one of the uh, researchers. Um, yeah, you see all of the four people. You know, you have a view of all four people parallel eyes. Um, anyways, and then you know, at the end, trying to design these games together. So these are some more um, pictures from some of the workshops, and here the idea is: uh, first of all, as I said before, we want to create a proof of concept by making and playing sports and augmented sports. So not just uh, ideation sketches or so on, but really demonstrations, demo or die. And then also getting fit ourselves. So far it didn't really work for me, but maybe in future. And then also creating this um, augmented game creators for the time being. And now you might wonder after these slides, um, hmm, what's the scientific impact. I mean, it's a lot of fun to do this, but you know, why am I focusing on this? Uh, and if you heard my previous talk two years ago, might know that I'm interested in recognizing and improving cognitive activities, so concentration, attention, comprehension, uh, and uh, I focus a lot on IREC computing. Uh, that's my old talk. Um, a little bit of background about myself. I was working with Jeans, a Japanese glasses company, on uh, sensing glasses that have accelerometer and also some uh, low-level eye tracking in them. And now since uh, actually December, I have some good news. I have uh, support from the Japanese government, especially as JST, to sponsor a collective open eyewear platform. And I'm also looking for collaborators so uh, to uh, work on this because I think this is crucial to start now um, because you know I don't want to end up in a situation that we have today with our mobile phones that we have you know just more or less or that most people just have two providers two big companies that uh, tell you what you are able to run on your mobile phones and I think I wear for me you know, believe it or not, because my track record is not so good predicting the future. Uh, however, I think eyewear is the next stepping stone, it's the next uh, 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 thing, and I really want to have an open eyewear platform out there. So that's the background uh, from myself. And I think, for me, the superhuman sports is a great testing ground for these type of technologies, and then really not only doing sensing, but also really trying to amplify human senses. In this case, I have to hurry a bit because I'm behind time and I want to still show a demo. However, here the idea is, is that sensors, digital sensors, are in some parts already better than human sensors. So, you know, you can have uh, higher frame rates, you can have uh, broader spectrum, so you could see infrared and so on. However, what is lacking from our side is the interface to it. So, I wonder really, can we create new and amplified senses based on uh, digital technologies? And just going with the um, uh, digital camera system analogy, I would just want to give you a small example at the end of the talk now. And that's uh, squint to zoom. So, you know, if I would be standing here and there's a sign in the back and I want to read the sign and I cannot do it with my normal eyesight, I will squint. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice if I could wear some kind of glasses that automatically, if they recognize that I try to read this and squint, would just zoom it in and I don't even realize that I'm using technology. And unfortunately, I wanted to show you a demo on the HoloLens. I have one here. Uh, however, I didn't manage to get this working on the HoloLens. And uh, I'm happy that I have a, a student, uh, George, who could set up a demo on, on a laptop that gives you a feeling how this works. So can you switch? 
so in this case, this is unfortunately just on the laptop, but you can get an idea. In this case, I'm using a Toby eye tracker to track my eye gaze. I have a camera and just a simple open CV to track my face. And then if I now go ahead and squint, it zooms in. I can show you also this on a, on a document. So if I squint, it zooms in. If I don't, it stops. And that's actually a very, very simple type of interaction you could do. I hope that could show it to you on an, on an AR system, but that's maybe something for, for next year. Uh, here again, as I said, you know, kind of the desktop eye tracker, and uh, I can show you a little bit how it works. So this is just an open CV system. I think George uses the uh, eyebrows and the relation to the nose and the size of my eyes. So if I squint down, this relation changes and it zooms in. And if I stop, it zooms out. Yeah, so this just should give you a small idea of what I'm trying to create or what I want to create, you know, things, uh, technology that's easy to use, that's, that you don't even realize that you're using, similar to the uh, analog glasses or so on. And also not only for sensing, but hearing and other senses as well. So uh, this brings me to the end of uh, my talk. I just have some obligatory thank you slides. So these are all people I'm working with and that, uh, that contributed to the research you've been seeing. And I have a special thank you slide for the students that actually did the work and especially George who uh, made the demo you just saw, but also Masai uh, for the effective wear and uh, the, the rest of the crew. Uh, now, um, this is the end of my talk, so now I think there's a time for a couple of questions, remarks, or violent dissent. So thanks a lot for your attention. Okay. Wow. Really cool stuff. That was so cool. You have a Thanks. chance to talk to Kai right now to ask him questions. There are four microphones in the room. So find yourself behind one of the, those microphones if you have a question. Um, also, the internet is always able to ask questions if they are awake by now. Does the internet have anything? Yes, one question from the internet? Yes. Is that code for eye tracking available? Uh, which one? So the which one? So for eye tracking, I can recommend you uh, Pupil Labs. So uh, the the eye tracking code right now, I'm just using Toby IX. So that's you know kind of Toby uh, proprietary. They have an API. Uh, that's um, hmm. it's just a desktop eye tracker. However, if you have, want to have a mobile eye tracker, I would recommend you the Pupil Labs. That's an open source eye tracker. They just keep the latest revision of their hardware closed source, uh, and they have all of their code up on GitHub. So it's very, very easy to, to adjust. And they also have uh, settings for VR headsets, so you can easily use it. You can just, uh, you know, kind of use, build your two own cameras, that's easy. Use their code if, you know, kind of you have budget constraints. Uh, the Toby IX is okay, but uh, I don't like Toby or SMI so much because uh, they use closed source. APIs and it's hard to get to the actual images because you know you want to have for example pupil dilation because that gives you information about stress and other things and that's not so easy. Great. Um, actually let's go to microphone number six please. So I have just a quick question about um, how open you are to be able to um, collaborate with different universities from around the world to use your technology in research. Uh, I work in, a, in the effective sciences department in the University of Geneva, mm -hmm. and we actually use a lot of motion 
uh, tracking. Um, this eye movement tracking would be super interesting for our effective science research, especially as well our facial expressions. We use that a lot. So effective eyewear would also be interesting. So um, you've discussed how to use it for like opening up possibilities in the real world and mm -hmm. actually enhancing everyone as a general population. But how open are you to using it for research as well? Yeah, very open. I mean, that's also the reason why I give the talk. I mean, now finally I get also a little bit of money to fund this uh, from, from the Japan side, and I really want to find people that want to collaborate on, on this side. And I think, you know, kind of, especially seeing uh, how Silicon Valley now also invests in eyewear, and I think the next thing we will see is eye trackers in VR and so on, and how close those systems are, I would really like to, you know, have this collaboration. So just try to catch me afterwards or just send me also a mail. Would, would love to, to, to keep in touch. Great, thank Thanks. you. And microphone number two, please. Well, thank you. Amazing talk. Um, how important do you think will be the combination of external signals like squinting or looking at something and internal signals, so like uh, directly measuring the brain waves or mm -hmm. with an EKG? Do you think that it's important to combine those or...? It's important to combine those. I actually, I started looking into a lot of uh, the EEG signals and so on when I started this work, but it's very hard to get into your skull. So EEG, <laughs> uh, also brain-computer interfaces, I think, will take a while uh, to, to work, and uh, you also have this trouble of the signal processing is relatively hard, and because I'm lazy, I started with the eyes, and the eyes give you actually already a lot of information you want to get from the brain. I, I like to think about combinations, so for some things we're already working with uh, also EEG, and I think it's, it's crucial to find the right type of sensing so that it works throughout the everyday life. I think one example was also genes, and now with the, with the, the uh, JST project, what we're really trying to do is find simple sensors to give you some information about your, your, your brain activities and so on. And I think it's really a combination of multiple sensors. And I think, as I said, the eye is very, very interesting. Yeah, thanks. thanks. We have time for one more brief question. Number four, please. Uh, when I was wearing an uh, AR glasses, uh, my brain messed the distance to objects. So I, I couldn't grasp anything. It, it just wasn't there where I expected it. Yeah. Uh, is there any chance this uh, problem will go away? Ah, uh, this depends highly on the land. So there's still this problem. It's also in VR. I mean, VR has this trouble with the, with the, 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 the perception uh, view. I think, you know, you will have always this issue. I found AR, so the HoloLens quite good for this. But here the problem is also you cannot grasp something because the, the distance to the object is too far. So I'm still wondering, I haven't seen something that's really, you know, kind of graspable, graspable in VR where you have the right distances or so on. I think either your brain has to get used to it, which I think it does after a while, it gets the distance me measurements correct, or we have to employ some other tricks uh, to, to do that. What you can do for that, I'm not so sure. Thank you. Great. And Thanks. with that, um, we're at the end of the talk. Thank you so much, Kai. Please help me. Thank Kai Kunze. Thanks.